Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning as we celebrate the first Sunday in Lent and we offer up our praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. Well, it's been two years since I've been here. I'm delighted to be back this morning. Just an update on, uh, on my last two years in since I've been here with you folks. Uh, I spent, after I left here, I was over at uh, Boyden at uh, St. John and did about a seven month interim ministry there. And now here, just starting last week, I am the interim pastor in Sheldon, at, at uh, St. Paul in Sheldon. So I will be there until they call a, a new pastor. So uh, the Lord has kept me busy and I never know where I'm gonna be next. Um, please read the announcements in your bulletins, uh, midweek services, of course. Uh, we started out with Ash Wednesday last week and so we have the first midweek Lenten service coming up this Wednesday at 6.30 with a soup potluck and then seven o'clock is your worship service. There's a sign up sheet in the narthex if you'd like to bring a soup for this meal. And the topic of your Lenten services is the 10 commandments and this week will be the introduction and the first commandment. And then there's an announcement in your bulletin about ordering an Easter lily. It needs to be done by next Sunday and uh, as you know, with uh, Ash Wednesday being last Sunday, Easter is early this year, March 31st. Uh, so the Easter lily needs to be ordered if you're interested in doing that. Are there any other announcements that need to be made this morning? If not, please stand for the call to worship. We gather under the sign of the cross and in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. Teach us your ways, O Lord, that we may walk in your truth. Give us undivided hearts to honor your name. Your steadfast love never ceases. Your mercies never come to an end. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, for he made us all. Come, let us worship him. Our opening hymn, Lord Jesus, think on me. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Beloved in the Lord, 
God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie, and the truth is not in us. But if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus washes away all our sin. Let us confess our faults to God, knowing that he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, who knows us, you have shown us what is good. So we have looked to us. People of God, you have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, poured out for you in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Hear the promise first given in baptism. You are God's child. Your sins are forgiven. Rejoice and be glad, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. The Lord be with you. And let us pray. Holy God, through the covenant of baptism, you give us new life for the sake of the world. Sustain us by your Holy Spirit. Strengthen us in times of temptation and protect us from all evil. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Do we have children this morning? I don't see any. So we will, we, I see little ones. But, <laughs> but uh, so we will forego the uh, children's uh, chat and uh, we will have the scripture readings. So our first reading comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 22, verses 1 through 18. If you'd like to follow along, it is in your pew Bible on page 31. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, Isaac, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. 
Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there was a thicket, and in there he saw a ram caught by the horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this, and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and your descendants, as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through their offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Our responsive psalm is Psalm 25, verses 1 through 10. I will read the odd ones, and you can follow along with the even. To you, O Lord, I lift my soul. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Guide me in the path and teach me, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. Our second reading comes from the book of James, the first chapter, verses 12 through 18. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, then, to is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be, kind, be a kind of first fruits of all he has created. Here ends our reading. The Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being tor torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, 
and he was in the desert 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Ah, the wilderness. For some of us, the wilderness paints the picture of woods and trees and streams and mountains. A beautiful place. A beautiful place to visit. Our vision of a wilderness is often formed by our travels to the western United States. But listen to this dictionary definition of a wilderness. An uncultivated, uninhabited, and inhospitable region. And from a Bible commentary comes these comments. The wilderness was largely uninhabited by people, occupied mainly by wild beasts. The wilderness was a place of danger. Dying of thirst was a real possibility. For the wilderness was a dry land subject to scorching winds. Resources of food were also very limited. Doesn't sound like a very hospitable place, does it? Today, we read about Jesus going into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. Mark wastes no time in introducing us to the adult Jesus. We hear the proclamation of John the Baptist. The next thing we know, Jesus appears. Jesus is baptized and he sees the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. He hears the voice of God proclaiming, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. And then the Spirit immediately drove Jesus into the wilderness. The wilderness was not the kind of wilderness we normally might think of. It was not a Colorado kind of wilderness. It was harsh and it was dry. And Jesus had some frightening company there. Satan, for one, and wild beast, who was not a source of food, but a symbol of chaos and threat and death. When Jesus was driven out into the wilderness, it was not for a rest. No, he was there for a test. It's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus is baptized and, he, and told he is God's own beloved son, and then immediately he sent off into the wilderness to be tested. Tested by Satan, who wanted to lure him away from his father, his identity, and his mission. Tested by the presence of wild beasts. Tested by chaos and danger and death. Jesus is baptized, and then he is tested. He is threatened by wild beasts and tormented by Satan. But the Spirit has led him there. The Holy Spirit is there. And Jesus is also sustained by the angels of God. It is a time of conflict and struggle. Can we relate to that experience? Yes, our baptism is wonderful. A powerful reminder that we are claimed by a loving God for all eternity. But our baptism also launches us into a struggle. It is a struggle between good and evil going on right inside of us. It is a struggle between the power and mercy of God and the seductive, alluring invitation of Satan. Do it your own way, Satan says. You're in charge of your life. You don't have to answer to anyone, Satan tells us. Oh, how inviting that offer is. And so we find ourselves in a wilderness of sorts. It is a wilderness where we are tested. It is a wilderness where there are wild beasts. There is the beast of self-centeredness who urges us to trample on others and ignore God in order to have and do whatever we want. There is a beast of violence and war. There is the beast of cosmic upheaval, the many disasters that we have experienced in this world. There is the beast of greed. There is the beast of death. Yes, there are so many beasts in our wilderness. 
And Satan is there too, testing us. Testing us every moment, enticing us to wander away from God. There is Satan testing us, inviting us to pursue our own agenda, to disregard the needs and the cares of others, to have it all on our own terms. Yes, Satan is there. Peter Gomes, an American theologian at the Harvard Divinity, uh, Harvard Divinity School, in a sermon on temptation, offers this reminder of Satan's sly and sneaky ways. Quote, the devil is able to cloak himself in that guise which is most appealing to our weakest points. To the student he might come as an easy grade, to the professional person perhaps as recognition and wealth. To the Christian, Satan comes in that soothing voice of the Pharisees that says, thank God I'm not like other people, end quote. Have you heard that voice, the voice of Satan? If you have, you are being tested, tested in the wilderness. In fact, it's not even so much Satan who tests us. It's really our inner sinful nature that tests us. Peter Gomes again says, the struggle with evil in the world really begins with a struggle with evil within ourselves. Isn't that true? All too painfully true. An old Jewish story puts it like this. The evil spirit came once before God and wailed, Almighty God, I want you to know I am bored, bored to tears. I go around doing nothing all day long. There isn't a stitch of work for me to do. Well, I can't understand that, replied God. There's plenty of work to be done. Only you've got to have more initiative. Why don't you try to lead people into sin? That's your job. Lead people into sin? Lead people into sin? Muttered the evil spirit contemptuously. Why, Lord, even before I can get a chance to say a blessed word to anyone, he has already gone and sinned. How true that is. The temptations of this world are all around us. We are, as Luther says, saint and sinner at the same time. Saint because of the saving power of Christ and sinner because we don't always do what is required of us by God. We don't love God with our whole heart or our neighbor as ourselves. I do not believe that God brings temptation into our lives, but temptations are part of living in a world that is not fully redeemed. So all around us are things that would lead us away from believing in God with our whole heart and loving our neighbor as ourselves. There is a bumper sticker that reads, lead me not into temptation, I can find it myself. Temptation is a pretty common experience, and our batting average for resisting it is not always impressive. Our experiences are a lot like seat belts on cars a few years ago. And there'll be some of you remember this. Do you remember the seat belts with the with the always on buzzer if they weren't connected? If we did not fasten them, that infernal buzzer kept ignoring us. It went off the minute we got into the car. We knew that seat belts were not made to hurt us or unnecessarily restrict us. They were there to keep us safe, and the buzzer was our friend. But instead of doing what we knew was probably best for us, we would stick the seat belt behind us, fasten them, and thus shut off the buzzer that re was reminding us to do the safe thing. Anybody here remember doing that? <laughs> we Christians know deep down inside what is right. We even know that the right thing is the best thing for us. And God coaches us from the inside with his buzzer, the Holy Spirit, to help us resist temptation. But we often choose to ignore the buzzer and look for a way to shut it off. We ignore God's signal and follow our own, even though experience shows us that things get messed up when we do not listen to him. Sometimes we make other things godlike. We put our emphasis into making money, having power, being famous. Now those things in and of themselves are not wrong, but they are temptations 
when they lead us away from God. There is a story that tells this point very well. Many years ago, the king had a beautiful daughter. She had many offers of marriage, but she couldn't make up her mind. A romantic gal, she wanted a man who would love her more than he loved anything else. Finally, she devised a way to test the love of her suitors. An announcement was made and sent throughout the kingdom that on a certain day there would be a race. The winner of the race would marry the princess. The race was open to every man in the kingdom, regardless of his position. All that was required was that the man had to profess to love the princess more than he loved anything else. <clears throat> on the chosen day, men rich and poor gathered for the race. Each professed wholehearted love for the princess. They gathered at the starting line, prepared to run the course of many miles that had been marked for that race. Each man was told that the princess waited at the finish line. Whoever reached her first could take her as his bride. Just before the race was to begin, an announcement was made. The king, they were reminded, was a wealthy man with treasures gathered from all over the world. Not wanting any man to run in vain, it was announced that the king had liberally scattered some of his finest treasures along the course. Each runner was welcome to take as many and as much as he liked. The race was begun. Almost immediately, the runners began to come across great gems and bags of gold. There were necklaces and pendants and jewels, encrusted cups and swords and knives. One by one, the runners, prince and pauper alike, turned aside to fill their pockets and carry off what treasures they could. Blinded by the immediate promise of wealth, they forgot the, prim the princess and all their professions of love. All except one. He pressed on, ignoring what to him were trinkets when compared to the incomparable beauty of the princess and the prospect of gaining her hand in marriage, and he finally crossed the finish line. That is the way temptation works. It places things in our path meant to blind our eyes to the kind of life God wants us to live. With God's grace, we can learn to avoid temptation. We can learn to walk away from those things that would be God's in our life. With God's grace, we can keep our focus on Him and the love we have for Him. With God's grace, we can turn to loving our neighbor. We can learn to love someone else instead of loving ourselves. Yes, we are tested, tested in the wilderness, tested by chaos and death, tested by Satan, but most of all, tested by our desire to have it all and to have it on our own terms, no matter how it hurts others, no matter whether it tears us away from God. In our baptism, we are joined to Christ. We are joined to the one who was driven into the wilderness by the Spirit of God. We are joined to the one who was served and sustained in the wilderness by the angels of God. So in our wilderness, God is with us. The Spirit guides us. God's angels sustain us. And Christ gives us his power, his strength, and his forgiveness to help us endure and to give us a fresh start when we fail. For we do fail. We do fail the test again and again and again. That's why we need Christ. That's why we need this season of Lent, to remind us of the reality and power of our sin. To be sure, but also to remind us that the power and promise of Christ are stronger than anything, stronger even than sin and death, stronger than anything that would threaten to destroy us. And that's the good news. It's good news that will be made even more clear and real as we move through the season of Lent. The good news is centered in Jesus, who stayed focused on his mission. The good news is centered in Jesus, who will endure terrible suffering and horrendous death 
and then be raised to eternal glory. The good news is centered on Jesus, who does all of this, all of this for us. This is our only hope when we're tested in the wilderness, to put our trust and our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. And let us pray. Almighty God, your blessed Son was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan. Sustain us by your Holy Spirit. Strengthen us in times of temptation and protect us from all evil. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our hymn of the day, In the Cross of Christ I Glory. Please stand. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us lift up our prayers to the Lord for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Creator God, help us to be strong in the face of the tempter's power in the world. Give us a mind and heart for you so that when the enemy twists your words and seeks to lead us astray, we would be wise to identify his deception. Lead us into paths of righteousness and away from sin. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious Father, we know we can thank you in times of trial, for you are with us. Let us remember it is through tough times that our faith is refined in you as we grow more and more dependent on Christ. 
Grant us the wisdom to hear your word and be guided by your light. Help us to accept our wrongdoings and confess them when we fall short. Give us hope as we hear your gracious word of forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Healing Father, watch over those who are suffering in mind, body, and spirit, and comfort those who mourn. Provide for all in need. Give them strength of mind and a joy-filled spirit, trusting that you are with them and are the source of all healing and wholeness. We pray for members of our congregation, our community, and our families, and others that we name in our hearts. Surround them with your love, strengthen them in their time of need, and through the healing power of your Holy Spirit, grant them healing and wholeness according to your will. Give them peace in knowing that you are with them. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, we pray for the mission of the church and those called to preach the gospel. We give you thanks for Pastor Owen and his passion for sharing the gospel. Safely return Pastor Owen to us. Give us all faith to serve you with gladness. Sustain us with a living hope and kindle in us your love. Give us a passion for sharing the good news of the gospel that together we may live the gospel and do your will. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Lord, we pray for our neighbors in this world, that we may learn to love them as you first loved us. Let us seek to understand their needs so that we may fulfill your call to servant leadership. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us so we may bring glory to your holy name as we serve others. Let us be courageous in difficult times, always keeping our eyes focused on you. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our sending him, Awake, O Sleeper.
You can go in peace, loving and serving in the name of our crucified and risen Lord.